The next session is going to be on the management of acute coronary syndromes. This session will be chaired by Professor John Podonu, and he's, she's going to follow up with uh, Ghana's experience. And then we are going to have uh, Professor Ibrahima Baradiop from Senegal, also sharing the Senegalese experience. Shall we welcome Professor John Kodouni? You use this one. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers very much for making me part of this uh, uh, very, very successful uh, conference. Uh, without wasting any time, I call on Dr. Mrs. Jan to do the first presentation. Mrs. Jan, thank you. So nowadays, you know, medicine is based a lot on evidence. And so I've decided to talk today on the acute coronary syndromes using an evidence-based strategy. By definition, we can say that it is a group of clinical symptoms that is compatible with acute myocardial ischemia. And it ranges from unstable angina to non-STEMI and to STEMI. The pathophysiology is the same basically for all the three classifications, but just a difference in the severity. This slide is trying to explain really the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology basically, you know, is through atherosclerosis, and this is a progressive process. And so, this is a coronary artery. I guess. Hey. All right. The coronary artery, and this is the normal lumen, at least. And what happens is that you have fatty streaks being deposited in the endothelium, and this progresses further to form a stable plaque, a lipid-rich plaque, then it becomes calcified, there's either rupture or erosion of the plaque, tissue factor is exposed, and this stimulates the aggregation, the activation, and the adherence of platelets, and then once the platelets are formed, it also stimulates fibrin production, and then resulting in either total or partial occlusion of the blood vessel. And then if treatment is not done in time, what's going to result is death of the myocardium and unless you do some treatment urgently. Using ECG, we can classify our acute coronary syndromes into STEMI and non-STEMI. And STEMI is usually associated with total occlusion of the coronary artery. This ECG, you can see ST segment elevations in the inferior leads. And doing the angiogram, it shows total occlusion of that related artery. Then in non-STEMI, there's partial occlusion of the coronary artery. And in this case, the ECG, there's nothing on the ECG suggestive of ischemia. And so it's very, very important that you have to assess the patients correctly when they come in with chest pains before you just decide to discharge the patients based on a normal ECG. So why bother treat the patients with acute coronary syndromes. And these slides that I'm going to show there is just to show some of the reasons why we bother to treat. If we don't treat, what can result is aneurysm of the anterior wall of the left ventricle here. We can get IVS rupture resulting therefore in a VSD. We can have large multiple thrombi we're seeing in the left ventricles, and this thrombi can give rise further to stroke. And then you can see papillary muscle rupture, and if this papillary muscle is, on the left, is in the left ventricle, it's going to result in acute myo, um, mitral regurgitation. So again, STEMI, in STEMI, usually there's total occlusion of the, 
there's total occlusion of the coronary artery, that is the related coronary artery. And usually in this STEMI, what we need as initial approach is a reperfusion therapy. Whether the reperfusion therapy is using a pharmacological um, basis or catheter basis. We know that primary PCI is the best method of reperfusion to use, but only when it can be done in a timely fashion and when there are experts available to do this procedure. If not, they recommend that you do fibrinolysis therapy once there's no contraindications for its use. The importance of the, using the fibrinolytic therapy is that it has to be done as quickly as possible, and the recommended time is less than 30 minutes once the patient arrives. And it's very, your, 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 your goal really is to obtain a TIMI-3 flow, which is a normal flow for the patients. Now we'll talk a little bit about the, the medical management of ST elevation myocardial infarction. So how do I treat it, and where do we do it? A lot of patients love to stay home. They have chest pains, but they refuse to go to the hospital. So once there is symptom suggestive of acute myocardial infarction, you need to get the ambulance and get to the hospital. Again, we have there the ST elevation. Um, diagnosis and treatment is in the ambulance. And so the 12-lead ECG is very crucial for you to diagnose the ST elevation. That's the only way you're going to know that there's an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And here we have an ECG showing an anterior lateral myocardial infarction. And our treatment, as we can see, the morphine, we start with the oxygen, the nitroglycerin. You use dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, and any of the ADP antagonists loading dose, and then you continue with maintenance dose. And beta blockers usually are indicated once there's no contraindications to their use. Again, as we mentioned, in the path of this, it's all about the platelets. And dual antiplatelet therapy makes sense because we're blocking the receptors. We're blocking, sorry, we're blocking different receptors on the platelets, and that way we have a more effective treatment management. So for example, with the aspirin, they are COX-1 inhibitors, they work at this phase, and the ADP antagonists, they block the P2Y12 receptors. And so with dual antiplatelet therapy, you get more effective control of the three A's of the platelets, the adherence, the, aggregation, the activation, and the aggregation. There are also other receptors to be blocked, but because of time, I'll just talk about this too. This slide here is showing, is showing that aspirin is comparative to streptokinase in reducing the number of vascular deaths. And using the two together, both aspirin and streptokinase, there's additive effect in the reduction of the number of vascular deaths. Again, Ticagrelo is the new drug on the market. That's the Berlinta. And it is a P2Y12 inhibitor. It's in the same group as clopidogrel, but unlike Clopidogrel, which is an inactive prodrug, which requires the cytochrome P450 for its ox oxidation so that it can be converted to the active metabolite, Ticagrelo, however, does not require this mechanism. And therefore, it tends to be more potent, faster acting than the Clopidogrel. And because of this, this, the importance of this activation of the Clopidogrel into its active drug, you sometimes have some non-responders of clopidogrel. Again, clopidogrel in the COMET study, it was showed that adding clopidogrel to aspirin, it reduced deaths, it reduced reinfarction, and it reduced stroke. And here in the PLATO trial, this was a trial where clopidogrel was compared with ticagrelo, and they were comparing the primary endpoints and the endpoints were cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. And in the first 30 days, there was really minimal difference between clopidogrel and ticagrelo in the ability to decrease cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. But as 
the time period prolonged, you realize that they're significant, that, that, that Ticagrelo was superior to clopidogrel in reducing the cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. I'll skip this slide. In this slide, it's really showing results from the Triton study where clopidogrel was compared with pasugrel. And in this slide, pasugrel, prasugrel, sorry, was superior than clopidogrel in reducing cardiovascular deaths, MI, and stroke. But that came at a cost. There was more bleeding with prasugrel than with clopidogrel. Here is not the same, our treatment must, we must individualize our treatment. All the patients are not the same. So it's not the same using a dual antiplatelet therapy in this patient along with anticoagulants, loading those and then maintenance those as in this elderly, frail woman. So we have to look at the patient on, our, on a whole and not just use everything written in the guidelines. Now we'll talk a little bit of the fibrinolytic agents or the thrombolytic agents as some people know them. They're usually called fibrinolytic agents because what they really do is that they degrade fibrin. There's benefits of using the fibrinolytic agents because they preserve left ventricular function. They reduce the rate, and this is particularly for streptokinase, it reduces mortality by about 18% if it is administered within the first four to six hours. The reduction in mortality is increased even more the sooner you apply the thrombolytic agent. So with the use of the thrombolytic agent, it's all about time. Time is muscle, so we need to use it as soon as the patient appears and make use. Streptokinase is a non-specific fibrin agent. But nowadays, in a lot of center, it is still the most commonly used fibrinolytic agent. And the main reason is because it's much cheaper. It has a lot of problems associated with it, but it is much cheaper, so usually it is the first-line treatment for the fibrinolytic agents. Indications, I think we all know the indications already of the fibrinolytic agents. All the patients who present with ischemic symptoms, symptoms suggestive of acute myocardial infarction, when the time onset of symptoms is less than 12 hours, and or if the patient has a new left bundle branch block or there's ST segment elevation. This indication has also been extended to patients presenting within 12 to 24 hours of symptom onset. And these are in patients who have evidence, whether clinically or by ECG, there's evidence of ongoing ischemia, where there's a large area of the myocardium at risk, or the patient is hemodynamically unstable. There are more fibrin-specific agents. The only problem with these fibrin-specific agents is that they are very, very costly. The cost is sometimes five to even ten times more than the streptokinase, but they are much more potent, much more effective, better results than the streptokinase. And this is just some of the adjuvant therapies that we use with our dual antiplatelets and with our fibrinolytic agents. So the anticoagulants, whether you want to use the unfractionated heparin or enoxiparin, the low molecular weight, you, have, you use high-dose statins. Beta blockers, as I said, you try to start the beta blockers as soon as possible within the first 24 hours if there are no contraindications to its use. And you start off also, if possible, with an ACE inhibitor, and if there's contraindications to the ACE inhibitor, then you use the ARBs. And particularly, the ACE inhibitors, particularly when there's a patient, with left ventric, a patient who has a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40, or is some anterior myocardial ischemia or infarction, really. Now for the patients with the non-ST elevation. We know that in the acute myocardial syndrome, about 50% of the patients have non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And so a high index of suspicion is needed so that you can diagnose this pathology. And in these patients, repeated ECG and biomarkers are required. 
immediate modality, imaging modalities are very important. So echo, for example, plays a fundamental role in the diagnosis of the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Because they come in, they have chest pain, sometimes they may have atypical symptoms, even epigastric pain, ECG is normal, and then you say the patient is having gastritis, and you send them home. And then maybe even one hour later, or even two hours later, something that they tell, oh, the patient is dead. So it's very, very important. And then in the 2012 focus guideline, they recommend aspirin should be started. So dual anti, in these patients actually with the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, a conservative treatment is the method that is preferred. So you use dual antiplatelets, aspirin along with an ADP antagonist whether it's clopidogrel or ticagrel could be used. Also, anticoagulants is also used, and again, it depends on which anticoagulant you are more comfortable with. But usually, if it's the unfractionated heparin, it should be used within 48 hours because of the other problems that could result, and the anoxiparin is usually, they say, up to eight days or your duration of stay in the hospital. And then, the coronary angiography is also indicated, but usually when there's recurrent ischemia, and usually you add a glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitor before going on to do the coronary angiography. And that's it for the management. I try to be as brief as possible to keep within the time. So now I'll continue with the challenges that we face in Ghana in management of our acute coronary syndrome. And in Ghana, the incidence of coronary artery disease and therefore acute, myo acute coronary syndrome is increasing. Most of our hospitals, they're not equipped for proper diagnosis and adequate management of acute coronary syndrome. And because of that, the mortality rates are very high. Our center is very small and it is the only cardiac unit in the country where fibrinolysis is done. So it's the only center where we do reperfusion therapy for our acute coronary syndromes. And over the, so to give you data more or less, I did a study of the patients admitted at our center over the past three years. That is from June 2010 to June 2013. And we admitted 85 patients. The majority of the patients were males and the majority also, they were middle-aged males. That is between 50 and 59 years. 80.2% of the patients had hypertension, and the majority of our patients came in with a pain duration of more than 24 hours. In the patients that performed, where coronary angiography was performed, 56% of these patients are still pending to get a definitive treatment. So only 39% of the patients who did coronary angiography actually went on further to do either PCI or have cabbage done. But the majority, they are still pending to do either one of the two procedures. And so our managers, mag management scheme I just summarize basically what we do when the patients come in, we do the initial evaluation of the patients. We take a history, physical examination, and then we do 12 lead ECG. Because we are tertiary centers, a lot of the patients are referred from other centers, and so a lot of the times they come in already with an ECG. And so from this ECG, we can see whether there's STEMI or non-STEMI but we will also repeat the ECGs when they come. So here we, and we do the 12 leads so that we can classify them, whether they're STEMI, whether they're non-STEMI or unstable angina, or it's some other diagnosis. We also do echo for the patients and cardiac biomarkers. So once we have diagnosed that the patient has an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and the duration of symptoms is less than 12 hours, then we go on to do fibrinolytic therapy and we use streptokinase in our center. If they are between, the pain duration is between 12 to 24 hours, then we consider fibrinolytic therapy. 
And if the pain duration is more than 24 hours, then we use a conservative management for these patients. We use, as you can see, in most of the patients, we use dual antiplatelet therapy with either Brilinta, Clopidogrel associated with aspirin. And loading dose, maintenance dose, taking into consideration a lot of time, the comorbidities and the age of the patients. Then we use some anticoagulant for our patients. Some, we use either one of these three agents. The other important thing that we do for our patients is that we do an echo. The, we bring the patients to the echo room or we bring the echo to the patient and we do an echo for the patients. So that especially for our patients who have the <clears throat> non-ST elevation myocardial infarction so that it can help us with our diagnosis. And even those with the STEMI too so that we can see the extent of myocardial damage that's present in these patients. Repeat our bio, our, we repeat our bio, our cardiac markers, the ECG, and we do coronary angiography for the patient if possible. We do have, we have a cath lab where we have, we, do, and we don't do PCI, but we perform coronary angiography. The only problem is the cost, and so we talk to the patients and let them know the importance of it, and if they can afford, then we do PCI, for, we do angiography for them. And then we also do cabbage, so we recommend cabbage according to the results of the coronary angiography. And if, if we see that they, 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 they would benefit more from PCI, then we may refer them to a center overseas if the patient is capable of going overseas to have treatment done. If they're not capable of going overseas to have treatment done, then we recommend that they do cabbage instead of just staying with medical treatment. So our challenge is... As you see, patient delay is a big issue for us. Most of our patients come with a pain duration of symptoms more than 24 hours. And that too could be because some of them are admitted 